Now, let me tell you about Americanic. It is a book of essays. And this, it is only in German, by the way. The American, the English edition is only half this size. And this one has about twice as much stuff on the theory, my theory, my fantasy. If it turns, and I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll see if I'm right or wrong. But on, on the, the theory that, that Germans would appreciate what I have to say more than my own people in my own country would. We're going to find out. There's a lot of, uh, the book is mainly about American culture. That's what I originally set out in life to write about. I was going to be a historian of culture. And so there's a series of essays in this book about uh, what, I, what I call the banality of creativity. So about you know, everything that's wrong with our ideology of creativity. You know when you, you, you go around the city and everything is called innovation this and innovation that, and so I have a lot of fun at their expense calling everything. And, and there's a, a, a lot of essays about financial fraud. America is really be the homeland of financial fraud. And so I, I was fascinated by, the, for example, the Enron case when it happened. Uh, wow, 2001, a long time ago now. But it's the template for everything that has happened since, especially the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, we'll talk about that later. There's a, a essay, one of the essays that I'm proudest of is about Chicago, Illinois big city in America where I happened to spend a big part of my life and I traced the city's change from this kind of when I was a graduate student there in the 80s this neo-proletarian aesthetic this really you know, hard as nails um, kind of 1930s way of looking at the world to what it is now which is it's famous for this crazy competition among restaurants you know about this the molecular gastronomy there's like really really fussy cuisine you know, <laughs> that's Chicago. How do you get from that, from Nelson Algren to this, like, you know, emulsions and effusions and delicately, you know, lavender smoke or whatever. <laughs> and then I have a whole bunch of essays about the, uh, the folly of higher education in America, all the things that are wrong with uh, higher ed in the United States. And I strongly urge you to read those essays. And they're selling the book right out there. And I brought a pen that I'm going to sign it with. Yeah, big red pen. Yeah. But I know that nobody wants to hear about any. I mean, you, you probably do want to hear about those things. Then those things would probably amuse you. But you come to a talk like this because you want to hear about Donald Trump. I know that. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the political situation in America. I've been writing about it for a long time. You know, I never wanted to write about politics. I got into it backwards, sideways. I wanted to write about culture. But the more I wrote about culture, the more I realized that American culture is you can't talk about it or understand it or even think about it unless you understand um, business, economics, right? Or, well, actually, just business. <laughs> you know, if you, you have to understand business in America. And then to understand business in America, you have to understand the conservative movement. Yeah, why is America, you know, th this country that is dominated by business interests, unlike anywhere else in the world? Like, it, nowhere else is like us in that regard. And it's largely a political thing. And so I became fascinated with politics and this, I sort of backed into it. And now I'm trapped and I can't get out. And it gets worse every couple of years. And every couple of years, the, you know, all my most awful predictions come true. And, uh, <laughs> and so I have to keep going. Anyhow, I started out uh, doing journalism back in the 1980s. And it was the orange fingered sunset of the Ronald Reagan era. And I thought at the time, I concluded, that the, cons the rise of the conservative movement was the most consequential development of our time. And I mean by that, not just Reagan, but Thatcher and the rest of them. You know, and it's, it happened all over the Western world. And so I focused on this, and I decided that I would spend my life trying to understand this movement, how it happened, why it succeeded. And what came to fascinate me about conservatism was the paradox of the thing. Think about it. Our Republican Party in America 
has successfully inverted their brand image as the party, what they used to be thought of was as the party of the highborn. That's who the Republican Party was in, say, the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s. And they have remade themselves instead as the friend of the average man, the friend of the common man, your plain speaking buddy, right? The, the friend of the very people that had spurned the Republican Party in the 1930s. Now, the ideology of the Republican Party has never changed. It is the same today, with some modifications, as it was in 1932. That has never changed. And just look at what conservatism has done to those average people that it professes to love once they have opened up and welcomed it into their lives. What have its achievements been over the years? since the 1980s. Well, there's tax cuts, of course, enormous tax cuts. They've largely destroyed the power of the labor movement in the United States. They've deregulated so much that now you have these disastrous financial crises that are brought on by fraudulent behavior in industries that the rest of the world thinks we still police. But folks, I got news for you, we don't. The days when the US government got tough with monopolies or investment banks on Wall Street, those days are over. There are hundreds of objective statistical ways of describing how conservatism has changed the face of America. And I'm gonna talk about some of the, just a handful of them. Houses in America <laughs> get bigger every year. The square footage you know, enclosed by the perimeter gets bigger and bigger every year. There's a mania for what we call McMansions. Gigantic suburban homes. And in Americanic, I have a, a history of the McMansion. This is something you don't know about in Germany. <laughs> Houses are bigger. University is massively expensive in the United States. The university where I went to graduate school today costs $70,000 a year to attend. You go there for four years, that's close to $300,000. And by the way, it's not just the University of Chicago, all of the, uh, the top ranked universities are the same. They're all like that. This is happening everywhere. And of course, student debt, as a result, is out of control in America. As I travel the country, I am forever meeting young people who are 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 thousand dollars in debt. Folks, they're starting out life that way, coming out of college like that. Union density is, of course, way down in the United States. Members of Congress in my country routinely quit their jobs in order to become lobbyists. I recently read that the price of a certain pill went from $13 a pill to $750 a pill. And of course, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is above 26,000, or it was this morning. I don't know where it is now. Another way of looking at it, from the middle of the 1930s up until the year 1980, the dawn of conservatism, the lower 90% of the American population, a group that we might refer to as the American people. That group took home 70% of the growth in my country's income, right? And that was, when I was growing up, I was born in 1965, we thought that was normal, that 70% of the population should take home the lion's share of the growth in income. That's what we thought the middle class society was. That's what we thought democracy was all about. You look at the same numbers, from 1997, you know, the great dot-com bubble, remember that? Look at the numbers from 1997 up until today, and you will find that this same group, the American people, pocketed none of my country's income growth at all. The upper 10% of the population, by which I mean my country's financiers and managers, and professionals, they ate the whole thing. Back in 1980, according to an American labor group, 
CEOs made about 40 times as much as their average blue collar employee. Today it is 361 times as much. One amazing number I came across just the other day is that Jeff Bezos, the wealthiest man in the world, the CEO of Amazon, the owner of the Washington Post. Jeff Bezos earned as much in nine seconds of 2017 as his average employee did in the entire year. Nine seconds, folks. One particularly fortunate American family has as much wealth as does 40% of the population put together. One family. The main accomplishment of this family, this high achieving bunch, the main accomplishment of these people was to inherit shares in Walmart, the retailer that has sucked the life out of thousands of towns in the part of the country that I come from. Folks, the, <laughs> the rich people of today make the rich people of my childhood look like the Soviets, you know? <laughs> and these are, these are staggering changes, and they've happened in 30-odd uh, years. And they are more staggering still when you think about the politics that made it all possible. Take the conservative movement's signature economic ideas. You have the, have the same stuff here in Germany. Privatize, actually you don't. <laughs> okay, so this is all gonna be new to you. Privatize everything. Yeah, privatize everything. Let Wall Street run the economy. Get tough with workers and let wages fall where they may. Now, folks, with a few exceptions here and there, these ideas have never enjoyed mass public approval in my country. Never. These are not the kind of things for which people clamor or rally by the millions out in the streets. And were we to stage every election in America as a referendum on this economic philosophy, you know, and were the two parties to take forthright positions on everything I just mentioned, privatizing, financialization, low wages, and so on, every election would be a wipeout for the conservative movement. Well, that's not what happened. That's not how things have worked out. It's the opposite. Conservatives took a deeply unpopular political agenda and made it the elite consensus wisdom, not only of my country, but of the entire Western world. And that is the story of our time. How the hell did they do it? How did this happen? All right, let's try to figure it out. This is what I've spent my entire career working on. So I've given you the problem. Now we're gonna work on the answer. So this is a discontented age, and the Republican Party in the United States is very comfortable with discontent. They are, in fact, they are endlessly aggrieved. Uh, and this is, might sound strange to you, but you, it, modern American conservatives don't speak to us in the manner of conservatives of long ago, right? Like uh, William McKinley or uh, Calvin Coolidge or Herbert Hoover. They don't uh, invoke the divine right of money like John D. Rockefeller did. They don't you know, shake their, their finger at the, uh, at the working class and, and insist that they learn their place in the great chain of being as people did in say the 1890s. They don't do that anymore. They tell us that they are something very different. They tell us that they are enemies of the elite, that they are the voice of the unfairly persecuted, that they are a righteous protest of the people on history's receiving end. The Republicans tell us, tell you that they're, they're sitting right there with you on the couch in front of the TV as you watch some football player or Hollywood star insult your values and mock your way of life. Organize discontent was one of the famous conservative slogans of the 1970s. Organize discontent. That's not the left in America that says that. That's the right wing in America. That used to be a slogan of, you know, that used to be the kind of thing that you would hear a, a, you know, a 
a militant labor union, say, a radical group would say something like that, organized discontent. That's the conservatives in my country that say that. And you know what else? That's exactly what they do. They deliberately mimic the historical left. This is what the Tea Party movement was, right? They all get out there in the park waving their placards, pretending to be protesting Wall Street. <laughs> it worked. Or look at Donald Trump. Look at this guy. Look at his presidential campaign in 2016, where he deliberately tried to make it sound like he was leading an old-style left-wing protest. I'm going to give you one example, and it's, it's shocking. Um, it's shocking even to Americans, and they all heard it, right? But they, they didn't think about it. It's his final TV commercial, which was running in the last couple weeks of the campaign. They call it, in America, they call this your closing statement. The two candidates will uh, tape a sort of, uh, uh, you know, a, a commercial that sums up their whole message. And I'm going to read from Donald Trump's. <clears throat> in it, he, in this, his closing statement, he attacked what he called the political establishment, which he defined like this. It's a global power structure. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm tempted to mimic his accent, but I can't. It's a global power structure. <laughs> it's a global power structure that is responsible for the economic decisions that have robbed our working class, and he actually used that phrase working class. Democrats hate that phrase, they never like to use it. Uh, Trump used it, that have robbed our working class, stripped our country of its wealth, and put that money into the pockets of a handful of large corporations and political entities. You can just see him savoring the syllables of that word, entities. Anyhow, he's right, by the way, but he keeps going. The only thing that can stop this corrupt machine is you. The only force strong enough to save our country is us. The only people brave enough to vote out this corrupt establishment is you, the American people. It's like I, I, I heard that. I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. That's like something that I would say. This is, it's, it's idealistic. You know, you, it makes you, you know, you actually, you kind of want to like the guy. But then, you know, if you don't know any better, right? If you don't know anything about who this guy is. And then he becomes president and, uh, you know, right? He's going to go to war against the global power structure that has robbed us all. And what does he do? Gigantic tax cuts. More bank deregulation, you know? Huge deregulatory favors for all the big corporations, on and on and on. By the way, it's not just Trump. Conservatives in America all talk this way. This is simply how they do it. They pretend to stand up on behalf of the betrayed working class. It's incredibly cynical, and at times it can be incredibly perverse. And I'm gonna give you another example of it. This is the most perverse example I know of. There was a company that owned a coal mine in West Virginia where 29 miners died in a terrible accident about 10 years ago. <clears throat> uh, the CEO of that company later went to prison for violating safety rules in relation to that accident. But before all that happened, he threw a big Labor Day rally. Labor Day is our labor holiday in America. And he threw a big um, rally on Labor Day in 2009 in West Virginia, where he went up on the stage, took the microphone, and said that he was there to defend American labor because no one else will. Like Donald Trump, this CEO was standing tall, or he said he was standing tall against, quote, our government leaders, right? That's the real problem. Our government leaders who are, with their safety and environmental meddling, American workers' worst nightmare. This is the CEO of the company that owned the big branch mine. Folks, they have been talking like this for decades, and they have been winning. How do they get away with this stuff? <clears throat> to answer that, we have to, and because I'm a fair-minded individual and I like to present both sides of everything, as you can see, <laughs> we have to turn our attention to the other party in the American system, the Democratic Party. These are the guys who are charged with keeping the Republicans in check and making sure that they pay for it when they cause financial crises or when they tell 
working people that they're on their side. And guess what, folks? The Democratic Party isn't particularly interested in the job that I just described. I'll give you the most glaring example in recent history, which was President Barack Obama's response to the financial crisis. This is now 10 years ago. You might remember this, that he was elected president in a massive wave of hope and enthusiasm. Do you remember how he spoke in Berlin right before, the, not right before the election, about three or four months? Yeah. yeah. And the, he had the world behind him. I mean, people loved that man. He had the entire country at his back. He could have done anything he wanted. Majorities in both houses of Congress. And he proceeded to continue the bailout policies of President Bush essentially unchanged. No big banks ever got put into receivership. No bailouts were unwound. No elite bankers in America were ever prosecuted. Hell, they were never even, they didn't even get fired. He had seats on all their boards because of the bailouts. He could have done whatever he wanted with those companies. They didn't even lose their jobs, the people in charge of these outfits. He did fire the CEO of General Motors. Oh, but not Goldman Sachs. By the way, it, it, it's not, it, this was not a policy across the board. You probably don't know this about America. If you lied on a mortgage application in the last decade, you're probably in jail today. They came after those guys, little people, threw them in jail. There's all kinds of prosecution of those people. But if you packaged those fraudulent mortgages, they called them liar loans. They actually called them that, liar's loans. If you packaged those things up, made them into a security, got it stamped AAA and sold it to retirees in Dusseldorf, which they did, you're doing fine. You're still, you know, you're still CEO. You're still, you've got your, your billions, you know, you can uh, party every summer on Martha's Vineyard. No problem at all for you. What I'm saying is that Obama and his Democrats were presented by history with the most perfect opportunity on a silver platter and they refused to take it. They refused to change course when every sign was telling them it was time to turn. So the billionaires came to them crying for handouts, having ruined middle America, having ruined the economy of the entire world. And it was the perfect moment for Democrats to reclaim the heritage of Franklin Roosevelt and to govern forcefully on behalf of ordinary people, to declare war against you know, over-powerful corporations to demonstrate the power of the state to build a just and humane society, and they didn't do it. Now, I know the excuses. We've all heard them. The Republicans are so clever. They kept outmaneuvering the president. They wouldn't vote for Obama's proposals and so on. But it's 10 years now, folks, and from this perspective, I think we can see very clearly that what really mattered the only thing that really mattered was the absence of democratic will. Instead of doing what the moment required, Democrats helped the banks to get back on their feet and they stood by while inequality soared out of control. Those statistics I read at the start of the talk. They scolded their base, that is people like me, they scolded people like me for wanting too much and they extended their hand in friendship to Silicon Valley Mark Zuckerberg, right? <laughs> and Big Pharma. Those are the people that they really wanted to be friends with. The task of capturing public anger was one for which they had great distaste. And they left that job to Tea Party demagogues and to Donald J. Trump. Folks, we're gonna pay for that failure for a long time. The Republican Party should have been ruined by the financial crisis. This was arguably their, completely their responsibility. They should have paid for it the way that Republicans paid for uh, the crash of 1929. I mean, the Republican Party was basically out of business for 40 years after that. You know, they were a tiny minority in Congress. It took them forever to make it back. It, they, they weren't a majority in Congress again until 1994. But that's not what happened this time around. And instead, we're right back where we started. The culture wars are back on. 
You know, the racist dog whistles are blowing all over America. We're fighting over the flag again. And the persecution mania of the right is on every TV screen. We're right back where we started. The crisis went completely to waste. We learned nothing, or we seem to have learned nothing. So why didn't Barack Obama take that great opportunity to blast Republican leadership and to shore up the middle class society when it was right in front of him, when he had the perfect opportunity? This is the great question of Barack Obama's presidency, and we, I suspect historians will be debating it for the rest of our lives. No one really knows the answer, uh, but I'm going to propose one, and it takes us back a little ways into history, into the history of the Democratic Party. Back in the 1970s and the 80s and the 1990s, the Democrats were, like a lot of left-wing parties in the Western democracies, the Democrats were fighting over who they were. They were grappling with their identity, you know, uh, who they were, what they stood for, who they should be representing. They didn't really know. And you had all of these different factions in the Democratic Party in those days, and they would fight like cats and dogs but they all agreed on one thing, and that was that the Democratic Party had to turn away from the legacy of Franklin Roosevelt with its obsessive concern for working class people. That had to go. What the Democrats could no longer be was the party of organized labor. And so the links with labor had to be broken. Everybody agreed on that. They had to be a different party that spoke for a different group. And the man who sort of brought that fight to a conclusion was Bill Clinton, who was the Democratic president before Obama. And he brought a new kind of Democratic administration to Washington. In fact, they called themselves the New Democrats. You might remember this. And rather than all Democrats before him, when they would, when they would be elected president, they'd come to Washington. They'd do some, uh, something to signal their... Um, the legacy of Franklin Roosevelt, that they were, in the, they were the legatees of Roosevelt. And Clinton did the opposite. He did these amazing favors for Roosevelt's old enemies. He deregulated the banks. He ensured that derivative securities would henceforth be traded without supervision of any kind. It really happened, by the way. Uh, he deregulated radio, deregulated telecoms, and he basically put an end to the federal welfare system. Now Clinton, he's a really interesting man, um, a very capable politician, uh, kind of a genius politician, and he had a strategy as a candidate when he was running for the presidency where he would go out of his way to insult or to distance himself from some traditional democratic constituent group. Okay, do you remember this? He set up this, um, he, he managed to insult Jesse Jackson to his face while the cameras were rolling. Do you, do you know about this? It doesn't really matter. You don't need to know it. But he used to do this. And it was a way of assuring the public that he wouldn't be um, beholden to what they used to call special interests. Now, what's interesting about Clinton is that this eventually, it went from being a campaign strategy to a strategy for governing. Okay? So body slamming the people who had just got you elected. Now, the classic example of this is uh, something called, I don't know if you know, what this, know about this in Germany at all, it's called the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA for short. And it, was, it had been negotiated by the Republicans. Um, and the Republicans, though, couldn't get it through Congress because back then Congress was traditionally always controlled by Democrats, by pro-labor Democrats, and labor was very much against this, tr this trade agreement, Clinton becomes president and he gets it done. Uh, he he uh, and his friend Rahm Emanuel fire up the steamroller and they, they drive this thing through Congress, okay? And it's regarded by Clinton's biographers as his greatest moment. What a triumph that was. Folks, when he did this, he wasn't just insulting labor. He was conniving in their ruin. He was doing his part to destroy their economic power, the power of working people. 
and along the way to undermine his own party's greatest ally to ensure that in any kind of confrontation between management and labor in the years to come, that management would always have the upper hand because from now on they could always threaten to move the factory to Mexico. And in fact, they do it from time to time, but they threaten it all the time, something like 90% of contract negotiations. It always comes up. And this is Bill Clinton's doing, and it made the problems of working people materially worse. And working people remembered. And NAFTA came back to haunt Hillary Clinton in a terrible way in 2016. If you go back and watch Trump's speeches, Trump mentioned it all the time. It was in terms of the number of minutes that he spent on different topics on the campaign trail. Trade is probably, I don't know if it's number one, but it's going to be, it's either the trade or the wall or something like that. He talked about it constantly. Anyhow, to get back to our story of the 80s and the 90s, the Democrats have decided that they don't want to be the party of labor anymore. Well, who do they want to represent? This is where the story gets really interesting. Who Democrats had to embrace instead, the party's great thinkers decided, what they had to embrace was the emerging post-industrial economy and the people that the Democratic Party needed to identify with were the winners in this new economic order. The highly educated professionals who populate our innovative knowledge industries. And you know what I mean by professionals. I'm talking about people with advanced degrees. Uh, we usually think of lawyers and doctors, but it's in fact an enormous category of people. People who work on Wall Street are considered professionals. Journalists are considered people who big pharma, all these people. And that's who the Democratic Party is today. They are, the, they are a class party. It's just not the working class. They're the party of highly educated professionals. Now, the Democrats, of course, have other constituencies, as we all know. There's uh, uh, minorities, women, the young. But professionals are the group that comes first. They're the ones who sit in the front seat with their hands on the steering wheel, and the rest of us ride in the back. And it is their tastes and their manners that are always celebrated by liberal newspapers, you know, their favorite TV shows, their artisanal cupcakes, their handcrafted cocktails. <laughs> Anyhow, um, here's the point. American liberalism started out as a populist movement, and I mean populist in the American sense. Populist is a wholesome thing. But today, American liberalism is the opposite of that. It is a movement of winners and of the highly credentialed. And it is this shift from the traditional working class or middle class to professionals that explains everything that is frustrating about our modern day liberalism. I mean, think about it, folks. How do you get in a situation like we're in today where inequality is out of control, where we are headed back to a 19th century style economy, and where the party of the left has trouble taking advantage of it, where the middle class is disintegrating and people are turning to a mountebank, a demagogue, like Donald Trump. How is this possible? It is only possible, folks, when the party of the left isn't interested in its historic mission. That is the only way that you get this combination of inequality and defeat. Okay, one more point, and then I'm gonna shut up. And it's this. A party of the professional class, what does that look like? What does that mean? What do they believe in? I'm going to mention one thing, and that's meritocracy. The belief that the successful deserve their rewards, and that the people on top in our society are up there because, God damn it, they are the best. Okay? This is the first commandment and the only commandment of the professional class. Everyone gets what they deserve, and what they deserve was defined by how they did in school. So the only solution for inequality is to go to a really top rank college, you know? Those farmers out in rural Missouri watching their way of life, 
blow away in the hot August wind? What's the answer for them? Go to MIT, right? Go to Harvard. That's what they need to do. Folks, this is not a philosophy for reducing inequality. This is a philosophy for rationalizing inequality. It's always your own fault. The way you screwed up in grade school, you didn't get a gold star from the teacher back in third grade, or you, you, know, you dropped out of high school, or maybe you didn't drop out of high school, and maybe you went all the way to the university, but you didn't go to a good school. Or maybe you did go to a good school, but you studied the wrong subject. You didn't study a STEM subject, or 20 years from now they'll be saying, well, you, you dumbass, you studied a STEM subject. You were supposed to be studying Latin. But you see what I'm getting at, it's always your own fault. They constantly push the blame for inequality back onto you. It is a philosophy of winners, folks, and the Democratic Party in my country is a party concerned with winners. That's our left party in the United States, a party of the new economy winners. So you've got the Republican Party with like, you know, <laughs> the oil billionaires, and you've got the Democratic Party with the Silicon Valley billionaires, and one set of billionaires has really bad taste and likes really shitty music, and the other set of billionaires is really awesome and like recycles, you know? That's our choice. And it is the Democrats' high-minded abandonment of principle that has made Trumpism possible. Trumpism inevitable, I would say. And as I look out over the wasteland of American politics, I am increasingly convinced that there is really, there's really only one set of successful politics for an age of inequality like this one. And we see imitations of it, and we see echoes of it, and we see Trump pretending it, and we see even someone like Ronald Reagan mouthing it. But the party that it really favors is the party of the left, the party of labor. And Trump succeeded by pretending to be the heir to that tradition, you know, acting out this role as a rough-hewn reformer who detested the powerful and who really cared about working-class people. And now it's the turn of the Democrats to take that away from him. And they may have to fire their consultants, they may have to stand up to their donors, and they will certainly have to find the courage to change, to dump the ideology of the 1990s, this catechism of tech, bank, and globe that everyone can see now is nothing but an excuse for an out-of-touch elite. But the time has come, folks. History is calling. Thank you very much. Are we going to do questions, Susan? Yes. yes, we are. There was a song when I was a, I was a little punk rocker back in the day, and there was a song called, um, what was it called? Uh, Bogue Millionaires, Cool Millionaires. And I, can't, I don't remember the lyrics. You couldn't make out the lyrics. But the idea was that some millionaires were really bogus, and other millionaires were really cool. And you know, that was funny in like 1979. And today, that's our, that's our political system. You had 67 rappers actually wrote songs before the election, somebody calculated, um, with lines like, I'm going to be the black Donald Trump, uh, which is an interesting and problematic uh, fact about hip hop and what's happened to the culture that allowed him to um, triumph the way he has. Uh, if you want to keep standing, that's fine. But yes, we are going to have questions. It's all. You want me to sit there? I, I, I feel much more comfortable standing. Then go ahead. Um, He's, you know, he, it's, in some ways, Trump. The, the secret to Trump is pro wrestling. Do y'all have that here? This, 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 like totally fake kind of sport where people adopt these personas and they have these really larger than life characters and they fight with each other and they try to avenge their their friends and they do. Trump was involved with pro wrestling in America. And in some ways, it taught him everything he knows. <laughs> so I'm going to start out. I, I have a whole bunch.
bunch of questions, but it is a feature of the Einstein Forum that we invite our audience to um, talk at least as much, or at least for the same amount of time as our guest has talked about. Oh, so okay. We have genuine discussions. All right, so maybe I should sit down. Uh, up to you, <laughs> whatever you feel that I, I, I'm, I'm gonna start us out, though, um, with something that I found missing in your discussion, which may also be why uh, I have a somewhat different take on Barack Obama than you do, but I don't want to have that out. I want to ask you about the force of racism in this story. As you will know, LBJ said in 1964, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, when the first uh, Civil Rights Act was passed, that is the first time that racial di di discrimination was outlawed by law, although as we know it still exists, uh, Lyndon Johnson said, we've lost the South for a generation. And as a matter of fact, the only two Democratic uh, candidates to win the presidency since then, Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, were both very much Southerners and very much played on their Southern uh, roots. I am someone who is growing increasingly fond of the idea that the South lost the Civil War but won the peace um, in influencing American politics up to this very day. Yeah. And I wonder, uh, Obama is an outlier. It's my own belief that Obama became the president only because in 2008, the American people couldn't imagine anything worse than George W. Bush, and you know, took this leap into uh, uh, electing a black intellectual because uh, we thought something has to be better than, than what happened. So, but he is an outlier. We've seen the backlash. I wonder if you could talk about the force of racism in the economic story that you've been telling. Okay, so it's a you know it's a huge question, and you what you're talking about the South. Uh, I mean, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, the way I like to put it is, um, when Johnson was when they were doing the civil rights acts in the 1960s, we used to think of well, I was a baby, I didn't think anything, but what what people used to think was that the South was a kind of um, rump of America. It was a left behind region, and we just needed to pull them along and they would you know, catch up with the rest of us. And instead the opposite is what happened. And the, South, the South's ways uh, uh, seem to spread to the rest of the country. So for example, uh, the South has always been really hostile to uh, unions, right? And so they have the right to work laws and stuff like that. Well, now that's everywhere. That's, that's conquered the nation. The South has always been really hostile to public education. You know, they really they, uh, had a lot of private schools and stuff like that. I went to college in all the South. Comes, all this and they, comes from reconstruction, by the way. Yeah, oh, absolutely, right. And, uh, and that's, now that's, that attitude is everywhere. There's all of these Southern, uh, uh, d traditional Southern attitudes that have now, that have conquered the country. And yes, it is obviously a huge part of Donald Trump's, uh, uh, Donald Trump's emphasis. But I, I, I and I, you know, we could talk about this a lot. Donald Trump strikes me as, uh, you know, his bigotry is, is uh, astounding. Uh, it's loathsome. Uh, you know, you, you can't believe you're, you're seeing it and hearing it. Uh, but at the same time, I try to emphasize the, what I, the, the story that I'm telling you tonight is one that you will not hear from, I think, any other commentator. I'm the only one that talks about this aspect of the, the, uh, of the story. But uh, it's, that's, a, that's a huge part of it. Because but I, I, don't, I don't think that, um, so I just want to say something about Barack Obama. I think people were, uh, you were right that he won because of the situation in 08. It was a unique time and it made unthinkable things possible. Uh, the economy, the stock market was in free fall. The economy was coming to pieces. Uh, and I knew, I know people who were very conservative who voted for him. And they were proud to do it and they were happy to do it and they felt good about doing it. I was, I had gone to the University of Chicago where he was a professor and I not only felt good about him being president, I was one of these people who was ecstatic about it, you know. I was overjoyed. 
And I always take a different uh, narrative than everybody else, but one of the reasons I was, I'm changing the subject very subtly on you here, uh, Susan, the reason I was overjoyed with Obama becoming president, aside from the obvious ones like, you know, uh, you know the, the, I'm a Democrat, he's a Democrat, et cetera, I knew that he was, uh, he's a very smart man. So I've met him, and he's, a, you know, he's obviously highly intelligent. He was a professor at Chicago. And I knew that he would bring the uh, best minds in America into his administration. And at the time, I was a great believer in government by expert. That made sense to me. It makes sense to everyone. That seems like the right thing to do, right? And here's George Bush had filled his administration with hacks and cronies, these incredible incompetence. Um, and the, you know, running people through the revol do you know what this means, the revolving door? So someone would come from Wall Street and Bush would hire them to regulate Wall Street. Or someone would be regulating Wall Street knowing that they were going to take a job from Wall Street very soon after they quit. And so they go back and forth from the industry that they're supposed to be regulating and guess what? They turn out to be terrible regulators and they just don't care what's happening. And like the chairman of Bush's Securities and Exchange Commission was like, you know, where was he when the financial crisis happened? No one knows. <laughs> he wasn't even paying attention. And th it, was, it was all like that. And I looked at Obama and I thought, fantastic. We're going to get a real, you know, a thoughtful man as president. And uh, in this, at this moment of national crisis, he is exactly what we need. And he comes in. And he brings in all of these people who were from Wall Street, just like George Bush had done. And they proceed to treat the Wall Street, the, the sort of the villains of the situation, in exactly the way that I just described in the talk. And I couldn't believe it as this was unfolding. I'm really wandering away from your point, and I'm so sorry about that. Well, you're making an argument that's actually not unfamiliar to many people here who um, I'm always astonished as an American who's lived here for a long time about how well-educated people tend to be about certain aspects of American politics. Yeah. They follow them quite closely and have a series of interpretations. And that is a fairly standard interpretation of Obama that one hears all the time here by political scientists. The failure of expertise? No, no, but the, you know, the, the bringing in Wall Street and... Yeah. Oh, well, we, but, the, but it's, anyhow, it's, well, it's an I, interesting point, but I, 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 I got far away from what you were saying. What and basically, I think people don't, if I could just, just um, sort of emphasize the point, and then I'll shut up and let some other people ask you questions. Um, uh, what I think people hear often very much forget about is the way in which racism was a factor from, yeah, there was jubilation for about six weeks and, uh, you know, between Mitch McConnell saying our only goal is to make him a one-term president, yeah. the rise of the Tea Party, yeah. um, an incredible amount of racism hamstringing him in every way. Yes, of course, it was a, a big mistake. Uh, to get uh, Larry Summers to do, you know, to fix the financial crisis. But the fact is he brought in experts, I mean, if we only compare it to this administration, oh, in all kinds I of know. other areas, oh, I know. you know, be it foreign policy, science policy, climate policy, yeah. um, you know, economic policy is, I know you're, uh, you know, you're, this is one of your central interest, yeah. but I th or perhaps your central interest, but I think it's very important to, um, number one, look at the ways in which Obama actually brought in much needed expertise on all kinds of uh, important policy matters, and number two, um, in everything that he tried to do, he was stymied uh, by Republicans and the Tea Party, starting in 09, not no. even in 10. No, so. I, I'm, I'm really, I'm like, I totally know that. But let me, before I answer that, it is, it is important to acknowledge Trump's racism, which is just, it's disgusting and it's in your face, and he has fired up the far right in America like nobody, like nothing we've seen in my lifetime. Uh, I went to college in Charlottesville, Virginia, the University of Virginia. And uh, they, they had this insane rally there 
Um, was it last year now or the year before? Oh, it was the year before. But it was all over the press. Uh, but it was, uh, uh, you know, th that kind of thing was would, would have been unthinkable in the 1980s when I, was a student, Nazi, when I was a uh, student there. Swastikas and torches. And, and then they went around beating people up and then finally they killed someone. Uh, you know, it's just insane what, what happened there. That would have been impossible uh, at, any, at any other time. And so Trump has thrown a switch in the bigot mind that has you know, the, uh, sort of unleashed it in a, sort of, in a way that we haven't seen in my lifetime or since like the late 60s or something. And, and that is very frightening and it's really alarming. Um, the thing is that's not you know, what I write about. <laughs> There's many other people who write about this and do a really good job. And I focus on these other things, okay, but I have to uh, the, in the, interaction, the the but. the oh no no and, and I I'll talk about it if you want me to and I'll, I'll you know, but the the failure of expertise during the Obama administration is actually a fascinating thing, and one of the points that and that's that's largely what's one of the, the the grand themes of Americanic. One of the things that is that is most interesting when you watch the Obama team take on Wall Street, which was the challenge that they were elected to do, right? What are you gonna do about Wall Street? What are you, how are you gonna make sure that this never happens again? How are you gonna punish these people, et cetera, et cetera? And, uh, and they, they declined to take the same steps that previous administrations had done, Name, namely Franklin Roosevelt, but also George W. Bush. Bush was faced with a financial scandal in the year 2001. It was this company called Enron that I mentioned. It's the first essay in the book is about Enron and its legacy. Bush prosecuted the, uh, the leaders of Enron, all the people in the C-suite. They went to prison. And they also, this is interesting, they were personal friends of the Bush family. And they pro he prosecuted them anyways. Uh, Obama didn't prosecute any of the guys on Wall Street, not one. And there's, uh, you know, all of these, um, you know, so the question is why. All of these, uh, and, and he's not, Congress can't stop him from doing it. The laws are on the books. It's up to Obama to enforce them and his Justice Department. There's nothing they can do to protect Wall Street except for to make fraud legal or something like that. And the Republicans, they weren't going to do that much as they, you know, uh, deplored Barack Obama. And what you find is things like his Justice Department and his Treasury Department deciding to let these guys off the hook, even as they are going after all sorts of little people but to let these guys off the hook because they regard them as peers. You know, they went to college with these guys, they have faith in their, uh, you know, they believe in their, in, their, in their good intentions. They say, well, so they made one, you know, one little mistake. And what I learned in the Obama years that, that I think, um, that I think is, a, is an important insight is that elites often act at the top level anyway in solidarity with one another, even experts. Experts act, professionals act in solidar solidarity with other professionals. And uh, it, it, a kind of solidarity that they don't have with ordinary people or even people in their own profession who are lower down than them. And uh, this, is, this is a lesson that uh, <laughs> has been very painfully learned. And uh, I, I, I talk about it all the time. And I hope that this, uh, that, that, well, okay, I'm shutting up now. We'll agree to disagree a little bit, Dominic had a question or a comment. This might tie into what Susan was asking. Uh, I want to go back to the 70s um, because this is where your story begins, um, it seems. And so what, what exactly happened that caused Democrats to abdicate their traditional role of representing the working class? Was it, as I think Susan is represent, uh, was trying to suggest that once working class explicitly includes both whites and blacks unified as it had to after the civil rights era, that this was no longer a winning issue. So we had to find another less controversial issue. Or were there other factors that played a role in, in, this, in this transformation that basically led to Democrats becoming the aiders and abettors of conservative policy on your Yeah, uh, good question. So the, uh, it was the, the, the proximate issue was the Vietnam War. By the way, this all happened openly. It was, uh, it was not a secret. 
But the, on the Vietnam War, you know, which is this terrible catastrophe um, in America, the uh, uh, organized labor had, by and large, so a lot of the unions had supported President Johnson on the Vietnam War. And the Democratic Party came apart over <coughs> Vietnam. They were just, this is in 68 and 69, and they're fighting with each other in this sort of terrible way. And the reformers win. And they decide that the, you know, one of the things that they have to do is remove labor from its positions of power in the Democratic Party. And it's largely because of Vietnam, but also they were turning in general against unions because unions are these gigantic organizations that are, uh, back then anyway, were largely undemocratic. A lot of them were very, were racist. I mean, there's no question about it. They were, you know, it was very, the leadership of these unions was very white. Uh, and then the, the, the great sin of all that they had supported the Vietnam War. And I don't really, I mean, I can understand that, that, that desire to do that back in you know, the early 70s. That makes sense to me. The problem is when you do that, you, you know, and nobody could see this in 1971 or 1972, because the country, America, was extremely, we had the, it was a great middle class society. There was no problem with inequality back then, or it wasn't a big problem. You know, you famously have a blue collar worker living next door to a white collar worker, and they would live in the suburbs in identical houses, and that the only thing that differentiated them was taste. You know, it was a, it was a cliche. That was back then. But when the Democrats chose to do this, you know, to uh, essentially to defenestrate organized labor, they were setting the, uh, the chain reaction in motion that's led to where we are today. They didn't see that. They couldn't see that. It, it would be, it's just too far down the road. But that is the decision that made it. They said, well, we, you know, and they, by the way, they were very open about this. There are books written about it. Um, there was a reform commission in the Democratic Party and their, you know, their records are public. You can read them. And they said, well, who should we embrace instead? And they look at the college campuses and the kids protesting the Vietnam War, like Bill Clinton, you know, who was at Oxford or whatever, and then at Yale, at Yale Law School. And they said, well, that's, that's who. And you find in their writing the most, it's, it's almost this embarrassing kind of age of Aquarius crap, you know? The, the kids are so enlightened, you know? <laughs> it's, 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 it's awful. And uh, that's how they did it. And like I said, I can understand the motive in the beginning. It is very understandable. Um, it's very uh, honorable, even. But it led to something disastrous years later that they didn't foresee. Misha. Thanks. So I like your analysis a lot. Um, but if we put it in a larger international context, we'll see that there are similar processes going on in other countries, right? It's not just about the Democrats' contingent decision in the specific context of US history to switch constituencies, right? So what does that mean? That's right, They've all, the, the Labour Party in Britain did the exact same thing. Yeah, and if we, you know, if we look at the party systems in, in Western Europe in general, we see that we have, let's say, the rise of the Green Party in, in Germany, which nowadays is no longer you know, exclusively a left-wing party, it's the party to a large degree of, you know, well-educated urbanites who recycle, but then also fly across the Atlantic. Right? By the I, way, I recycle. I, when I when yeah. I said that, I wasn't I wasn't no, no, saying no, you like, shouldn't no, recycle. Shouldn't <laughs> you flew across the Atlantic. <laughs> but, yeah, that's but, right. So if we if we take the U.S., I mean, the U.S. is never again going to be primarily an industrial power, right? So the rise of the of the professional class has to do not just with the Vietnam War, but with you know the, the change in the structure of the U.S. economy, right? because of international competition, et cetera. So the professional class is here to stay. So what do you suggest the Democratic Party do in that situation, given that you know, the working class is shrinking, just objectively? The professional class is on the rise in a, in a country like, the, in a post-industrial yeah. country like the United States. What do we do, you know, even if we now realize that we have to tackle the problem of social inequality, the, the kind of reorientation towards the professional class is a problem. How do we go from here, given the fact that we are, we're living in service economies in the West? So I, 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 I by the way, I'm, I don't have a problem with the, uh, the sort of grand 
the meta-economic narrative that says we've transitioned from industrialism into post-industrialism and that sort of thing. I think that's, that's largely correct. The problem is, is, them, is the Democrats identifying with the winners. That's my, that's my problem, rather than with everybody else. And so that you now have two parties in America, you know, both parties that identify with different species, different flavors of winner. That's my problem. Now, how do you, how do you solve uh, for inequality and not alienate the professional class? So I can only answer for America. I'm sorry to say. It's like all I think about, all I you know, read about is the United States. I'm so sorry, folks. But I do have an answer in the American situation. And that is, you know, you reorient the party towards, uh, you know, the people who aren't winners in the new economy. Uh, issue like education, you know, where the costs of the university costs are completely out of control. Um, you do something about that. You make it affordable again. You know, this is, education is obviously extremely important. It has to be accessible to everyone. There are a hundred issues like that, but what the Democrats should do, in my opinion, is really focus on, you know, the, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to call them the working class, but the people who aren't part of the economic elite and their economic issues. And they, instead of, you know, what they've been doing all these years, which is focus on the culture war issues, these sort of righteousness issues, I think that they will, that the professional class can I uh, take a step back here? The Clintons used to have a saying. Was it the Clintons? Yes, it was the Clintons. When they would talk about people like labor or black voters or something like that, you know, uh, unions, they'd say, well, those people, meaning Democratic, traditional Democratic constituency groups, have nowhere else to go. Those people have nowhere else to go. And they're, you know, this is uh, obviously, this explains you know, if you think about it the right way, this explains the rise of Donald Trump. He gave them somewhere else to go. These people know that the Democratic Party has treated them badly for years and has overlooked their, their interests and ignores their uh, grievances, et cetera, et cetera. They, and Trump talked about it openly all the time, specifically when he was talking about black voters. He'd say the Democratic Party treats you badly and you should come and, I mean, they didn't listen to him, <laughs> which is good. But that's what he, he knows that, 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 that this tension is out there, and he talks about it all the time. My idea is that the Democrats should flip that logic on its head. Those people are the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, especially the white working class, that is the constituency that the Republicans are, are trying to win. That is the swing group in America today. You have to win those people back, and the professional class will stay with you because they have nowhere else to go. Can you imagine those people voting for Donald Trump? Like the people, the, 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 the men and women of good taste in Bethesda with their artisanal cocktails and their, you know, their, their bike paths and their, you know. Can you imagine someone like that voting for Donald Trump? It, never in a million years. Although Obama didn't win that constituency either. The uh, professionals? No, sorry, the white working class. Oh, he did much better than, oh my God, yeah, he did in 08. He in did, 08, well, he, did, he yeah. did better than Hillary, but yeah, still yeah. his victory no, it's was been a not hemorrhage. built on them. Yeah, no, that's right. It's, you're exactly right. They've been leaving the Democratic Party steadily for, since the 80s. This is the story of what's the matter with Kansas. I know. And uh, uh, it's, uh, um, you know, it's a, it, but there's, every now and then they have better years. So Obama in 08 was, there was a lot of hopefulness that he was going to be a Roosevelt kind of president. The unions loved him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It didn't work out. But I was, um, and I, I know I should shut up now and let the next person ask the next question, but one of the better essays in this book that I'm proud of is where I visit a, uh, a Trump voting area, and it's small towns in uh, north central Missouri. So I'm from Kansas City originally, and I go to, I want to find the ultimate small town that went for Donald Trump. And I chose Marceline, Missouri, which is um, Walt Disney's hometown. <laughs> Have you guys ever been to uh, Disneyland? So when you enter Disneyland, there's a, 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 an area called Main Street, USA. And it's very beautiful. And it's like, it's like 1905 for eternity. And there's, you know, barbershop quartets. And there's a brass band. And there's a band stand and a funny train going around. And every, it, you know, and it's so happy. It's based on Marceline, Missouri, his hometown. That's Walt Disney's childhood dream. And so I went there. <laughs> 
And I don't want to uh, badmouth Marceline because these are great people. These are really fine uh, uh, people that I like a lot. But it's, 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 it looks like every other small town in that part of Missouri. But I will, I'll talk, I feel better talking about the town next to it, uh, which is the county seat of a nearby county. It's called Macon, Missouri. And it's, um, it looks like Detroit. It looks like it's in a state of ruination. And this is every small town in that part of America looks like that. The buildings in downtown are boarded up. Um, I mean, the, this, in this town, the bank was standing, the door was, you know, it's been abandoned for years, their bank, and the door is just swinging on its hinges. Uh, and it's largely empty. Um, I mean, the, the downtown, its vacancy rate is high in downtown is what I mean. The people still live there. They don't have their newspaper anymore. All the, you know, uh, uh, retail businesses have been, um, it's all been sucked away by Walmart, of course. And as this has happened to these people, and this is, by the way, happening all over the Midwest. You know, the small towns are going through the ringer. As this has happened, these people have become more and more and more Republican. Okay, again, the party that traditionally that's identified with, with wealth in America. They have become more and more Republican as their lives have disintegrated. And this is a part of America that was once profoundly democratic. This is Harry Truman's home state. This is where Dick, Ge Dick Gephardt is from. This long list of democratic politicians come from Missouri. And now, and this, this very county, I don't remember the numbers anymore, but Obama did pretty well there. And Hillary, God, Trump won it by something like 70%. It's just as these people's, I mean, you're, you're looking at a, a way of life disintegrating for millions and millions of Americans. And yeah, they go for a guy like Trump. It's, it's a desperate, it's an act of desperation. But they were also willing to go for Obama, you know. I have a question following up on that, but I'd like to give somebody else a chance. If someone would like to raise a question or a comment uh, of Deutsch, we'll be happy to translate. There's a good chance I'll even know what you mean. <laughs> While you're thinking of your question, I, I want to follow up. You were talking about Truman Democrats um, in Missouri. We just had a conference on uh, the bomb. Maybe I should sit down. I think I'm going to faint here. All right. I ate all that chocolate before I try to get some energy, but okay. And uh, Truman may have been a Democrat, but he was also a vicious cold warrior. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what happened to the American labor movement. I think um, something like that happened internationally, but um, you're focused on America. Um, because of the Cold War, because that's another feature that I think uh, needs really a lot of attention. We had a very strong labor movement in the 30s yeah. and the early 40s. Yeah. And um, tarring anyone like Henry Wallace, who was not, you know, we didn't call them the neoliberals, but um, who was um, strongly supporting labor, strongly anti-imperialist, uh, was tarred with a communist brush yeah. that it seems to me, I'm not a historian of the subject, but played a gigantic role in killing the American labor movement. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a big, big story and it's not, I'm not a, a great authority on it, but yeah, you're certainly right. I mean, they, they, the la labor unions purged their uh, radicals uh, in this period that you're talking about after World War II. And they, not only that, they signed up with the Cold War in a, in a huge way. I remember a joke in the 80s that, um, who was the head of the AFL-CIO in the 80s? Um, Lane Kirkland, it was his name. Lane Kirkland, and this is at a period of, of uh, enormous decline for American labor. They lost this big strike uh, in the early 80s and Reagan basically declared war on them and it was open season on labor all over America. And Lane Kirkland basically didn't do anything about it. Uh, and, uh, uh, but he really, really cared about what was happening in Poland 
at the time. You know, well, we all did, right? But he really cared, and so the joke was that he cares more about unions in Poland than he does at home. And he did. We, and he wasn't the only one. I know, I know. But he was a good, he, his heart was, I mean, he meant, he meant well. They all meant well, you know. But, uh, but yeah, the American labor movement really signed up for that, and I think because they felt like they had, in the, um, in the 30s and 40s, they had won a seat at the table. Do you remember um, C. Wright Mills' book, uh, The New Men of Power? In the, 30, in the late 30s and in the 40s, organized labor had enormous influence in American life, and this was completely new. They had always, you know, in the past they had tried and tried and tried, but they'd always lost. They'd always gotten beaten up or, you know, something terrible. Their leaders went to prison. You know, something awful always happened to them. And now in the, in the, the 30s, the government was encouraging them, and they became, uh, in, in like 1944, they were, that was basically Roosevelt's reelection effort was the CIO, they were called at the time. And uh, after that, yes, they wanted to keep their seat at the table as you know, being the new men of power, being among the power elite. And yes, they signed up for the Cold War uh, and they believed in it. And uh, to their enormous cost, I think, because we talked about how they, they, they kept the faith through Vietnam, which was just yeah. a terrible mistake. And they have never really recovered uh, from that. I mean, they're, you know, at their lowest point. You know what the union density is in America? It's like below seven percent or yeah, something in the private sector. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Martin. Thanks for the wonderful, lively talk. Um, it's listening to you. It sounds like a story about the interests the rational interests or grievances of the ordinary people and they themselves voting against those. Uh, maybe it's the wrong place to look for explanations. How about ideas, worse still ideology, worse still conspiracy theories <laughs> of various <laughs> sorts uh, that may at least help, not as alternative explanation, but may perhaps help to um, elucidate the, the explanation further. I'm thinking about, say, uh, the constant referencing by Trump of the deep state conspiracy or things like yes. that. By the way, that's another uh, example of the deep state is something that he swiped from the left. Right. You know, this, is a, this was, there's one of the, 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 the weird little details in this long history of American conservatism is all of the terms and the words and the theories that they have stolen from the left and repurposed. And deep state is, the deep state is one of them. That's like, uh, I've never been a, a guy that wrote about something, some, but I know people who did, and they wrote about the CIA and how you couldn't change the CIA and et cetera, et cetera. And now Trump has got hold of that. Um, another one is, well, another obvious one is fake news, which um, someone like the Washington Post was using uh, a couple, about two years ago, to describe these internet rumors that were deliberately invented by people. There's a, a sort of an industry in America of people who make up fake news stories and, and conspiracy theories, like you mentioned, uh, just for fun. And, <laughs> and it got really out of control during the, well, during, during the 2016 presidential election and uh, uh, wound up with a man brought an assault rifle into a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. because he had been told or believed that Hillary Clinton and John Podesta were running <laughs> a, uh, a, like a, a child <coughs> prostitution ring out of the basement. And <laughs> it's utterly mad. It's completely crazy. And so fake news was for a while this big deal. And then Trump got hold of it, and he started call, applying it to the Washington Post and to CNN. Another one, political correctness. This is a term when I was in college, yeah, exactly. we would use it. We would ironically, use it. Ironically. Yes. Ironically. We would describe Maoists. Yeah. You know, we'd be like, oh, yeah, they're so politically correct. God damn. Then one day the Wall Street Journal got hold of that. <laughs> And started using it to describe you me. Write for the Wall Street Journal. I did. That's right. I used to write for them. Uh, another one: the, the the idea of media bias. I know this isn't what you asked. I'm sorry. The idea of media bias. This is something that the old left used to always talk about. That the newspapers were owned by you know capitalists. So of course they were. You know, 
of course, look who publishes them. There's, they always uh, uh, shoot to the right, you know. They would say this all the time. And then here comes Richard Nixon, by the way, the, one of the great geniuses of American politics, Donald Trump's mentor in some ways. Trump really admires Nixon. We'll talk about some of Trump's other influences in a minute. But um, Nixon's uh, uh, campaign manager, or his media manager in 68, was a man called Roger Ailes, later founded Fox News. Fox News is one big extension of Nixon's 1968 presidential campaign. One of the ideas that Nixon and Ailes and their, their friends, Spiro Agnew, who was the vice president at the time, one of the ideas they came up with was the liberal media bias. They just made this up. It was during Vietnam, they're like, the media is causing us to lose the Vietnam War because they're so biased. You know, we don't know why, they're, why they keep doing this, but they're so liberal. And uh, it was just, they took an old left-wing trope and flipped it. And they're very good at doing this. It's, um, it, it's, it's, okay, I'm shutting up. I, I didn't even I wanna, no, answering your question. Can I, so sorry. can I give a stab at reformulating Martin's question? Because a version of it was on the list of my questions that I didn't want to ask all of. Um, what you're talking about, it was the same thing in What's the Matter with Kansas, yeah. is people who vote against their own economic interests. Yeah, well that's the, that's but, the whole story. Correct, yeah. correct. But the question that Martin, I take it, is raising, and the question that I have is, uh, you know, one can throw up one's hands and say they're all crazy, or they believe the Pizzagate stories, <laughs> but you, you did use the phrase abandonment of principle to refer to the Democrats. So principle is something rather different from interest. Yes, yes. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about the ways in which um, principles, whether holding to them or abandoning them, actually encourages people to act against their own material interests. Oh, excellent Do question. Hey, question? Martin, I'm sorry that I screwed up the answer so badly. Uh, but, that's, that's, uh, the, I, I see the way you put it now. So I, uh, I, I try to, one of the problems with writing a book where you, the, what's the matter with Kansas, which came out now 15 years ago, starts out with a lot of the stuff that you just heard tonight. Look at what's happening to our country. It's damaging ordinary people. You know, it's ruining their lives. Their, li their lives are being destroyed. Their way of life is going down the drain, and they're voting for it. And it keeps going, and it keeps getting worse, and they keep voting for it. And people in America uh, read that and stopped there. And then the rest of the book is all the different reasons why it's happening, all of my different you know, explanations and historical. But, uh, you know, it's forever thought that I, all I, I was just saying, oh, people are crazy, people are stupid, people do things against their own interests. And I'm, n I'm not saying that, would never say that, but people are doing things that are against their own interests. Uh, and principle, you raise a really interesting point because, of course, there are, they have reasons for doing what they're doing. Now, oftentimes, though, the choices are not I should say what some of those reasons are. Um, you know, uh, for example, what's the what's a what's a controversy? What's a culture war that's going on in America right now? People are pissed off because NFL football players uh, won't stand for the national anthem. Okay, you know that seems silly to me. I don't really care one way or the other, and I actually think the protesters happen to have a point. But for a lot of people, the flag and the national anthem have a kind of significance that someone like me doesn't really understand. And so for them, that is really important. That, and it's so important that they're willing to overlook all sorts of other things so that they can you know, get their way on that issue. The other things that they overlook, great examples of that in Donald Trump himself. For example, there's, um, Trump has appeared in a porno. Uh, he had his clothes on, but he was in a porno. We know that he had an affair with a porn star, or we're pretty goddamn sure that he had an affair with a porn star. Trump is on wife number three. Trump likes to boast about his sexual exploits, and Trump just got the votes of millions of American evangelicals. Now, how in the world is that possible? Here's, you know, how, how can you do something like that? Uh, because that would seem to be 
betrayal of principle. But they say, no, there's something higher. There's something even higher than having a man of God, you know, a, a, a person who follows these, uh, these principles. There's something even more important than that, and it's, you know, whatever it happens to be because he's going to, you know, he's going to stop abortion or something like that. You know, he's going to make people respect the flag. I don't know. People have all sorts of ways of rationalizing it. That wasn't the best example, was it? <laughs> <laughs> that just sort of makes it even more mysterious. Well, actually, they're the, voting against their economic interests. They're voting against their no. Actually, the evangelicals. That's a bit, been a big puzzle for me. Um, they have worked out a line, and the line is Trump is King David, and just like King David was a sinner who was used by God, an instrument of God is what to, they say. Yeah, 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 to do great things despite his own. You know, I mean killing men whose wives he wanted to sleep with and, yeah. and things like that. They have, and it's, so it's extraordinary the way they, they rationalize things. Now, I know I'm wandering off the subject, but I love to tell anecdotes. And I have, a, I have an anecdote. My, my personal pet theory about Hillary, how Hillary could have won the election like really easily. Well, she should have won the election really easily. Republicans nominated, the, what, he's the most hated presidential candidate of all time. He's never run for office before. She outraised and outspent him two to one. His campaign manager has never managed a campaign before. This is Steve Bannon. Didn't know what he was doing, and he managed to win. So there's all sorts of ways Hillary should have won, but I have a pet theory. And you want to hear what it is? Sure. <laughs> so nobody knows this, but Hillary Clinton is a Bible-believing Methodist who like corresponds with her pastor by email every day and has memorized big pieces of the Bible. And she talks in her me campaign memoir about going into a cafe and uh, reciting Bible verses with a man, you know, trading Bible verses with a man who's sitting there in the cafe. Okay, so when I was growing up in Kansas, we had a, we used to, you don't know this, but in America, high school students play a kind of trivia game, and it's often televised on local cable TV. You answer trivia questions. They call it college bowl. Well, down in, that's what we did in Kansas City. Down in Wichita, which is a much more pious city, down in Wichita, they play a game called, the high school students play a game called Bible Bowl. You know what this is? Bible Bowl. The announcer reads a Bible verse, and you have to leap out of your chair and identify it by, by a chapter and verse, you know, by book, chapter, and verse, yeah, or vice versa. He reads the book, chapter, and verse, and you have to jump out of your chair and recite that passage from the Bible. And I was thinking about this, and I thought, when they were doing their debates, you know, the Democrats, Democrats and the Republicans, and they were trying to decide the format for their debate, and they're like, okay, well, the first format is going to be, um, you know, we'll, we'll have a, a moderator who asks questions, and you know, and then the second format, the second debate will be a town hall style format where the audience asks the questions. And then what should we do for the third debate? And I knew the answer. Bible Bowl. It should have been Bible Bowl. Trump versus Hillary in Bible Bowl. She would have wiped the floor with him. It would have been a complete blowout. And, and it would have, it would have, you know, it would have at least problematized the votes of those people who think Trump is like King David. They would have, been, they would have had to, you know, reconsider that, <laughs> that, that kind of analysis. Oh, they could have perfectly well said King David didn't know his verses either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, is there anyone else who would like to ask a question in this moment? Because, ah, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I haven't read your books, but I know your essays in um, translation in Le Monde Diplomatique. Ah, and yeah, it's I think one or two of those is in this. Yeah, and it's always a, p a pleasure to read you, especially in a, in a French context. Um, as you may know, Thomas Piketty recently published an essay in which he uh, compared the fiscal policies of Trump and Macron, and he came to the conclusion that they were virtually identical, um, which leads a great portion of my generation to fantasize about a, a big showdown, a uh, presidential showdown one day. With, with uh, guns? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> let, let's say a, a far left candidate and a far right candidate. Yeah. Which may very well happen uh, in France. Oh yeah, uh, it's, you're, you're going to get that one of these days. Uh, I'm Swiss, so I don't really care. I just read the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but it could as well, it, it could very well happen in the, in the United States as well, into to a more, probably a 
more moderately so, um, Sanders is, uh, has uh, announced uh, he's yeah. uh, uh, running for president. Um, how, in terms of the, the, the professional public sphere, you, you, you mentioned the uh, Washington Post. How would the Washington Post deal with uh, such a situation? Would the Washington Post mm -hmm. sacrifice its capital interests and uh, support Trump? Or would the Washington Post uh, sacrifice uh, the, the little that remains of its uh, credibility as a liberal institution and support uh, Sanders? Uh, ah, uh, good uh, question. Or the, or the other way around. So Sa you're, you're referring yeah. to an essay that I wrote uh, in 16 about uh, the Washington Post and their war on Bernie Sanders. And by the way, that essay is, is, is in this book. And you should get it because it's there in the original. Oh, in the I almost said the original German. <laughs> and it's not. It's, I wrote it in English. But uh, the Washington Post is my hometown newspaper. I'll tell the whole story. I love to tell stories. And, um, and then I'll answer your question as best I can. Uh, the Washington Post is my hometown newspaper. Uh, I live in Washington nowadays. I read it every morning. And I wasn't a, uh, 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 I was a Bernie Sanders supporter, but I wasn't, you know, like crazy about it or anything. I just, you know, I thought he was the better candidate and I and I voted for him in the primaries and I also didn't think Bernie Sanders was all that radical. In fact, Susan, you told me earlier that like Angela Merkel's policies are in some ways to the Way left. Way far of him. to the left of Bernie Sanders. <laughs> I know. It's so funny, but in America, he is considered the uh, a kind of marginal figure. And but I liked him and I've met him and I think he's a I think he's a, 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 a admirable man. And I was excited to vote for him. And I would go out and pick up my Washington Post every morning in January and February of 2016. And they would be attacking him again and again and again, constantly. And I thought, you know, he's just not that bad. He's a, you know, he's a good guy. He doesn't have a lot of scandals. His ideas really aren't that radical. Why do you hate him so much, Washington Post? And as I always do when I have a, a question like that, a problem like that, I write an essay about it. That's how I get to the bottom of it. And so I read every editorial or op-ed that the Washington Post ran about Bernie Sanders that, that mentioned his name, every single one from January to June of 2016, and tallied up all the different ways that they went after him. And it, 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 was, it was absolutely fascinating. But what I ultimately discovered, and this is, it's especially interesting now that everybody is mimicking Bernie Sanders, they, they were basically, uh, he was unacceptable because he, you know, the Washington Post, to get back to my theme of professionals, the Washington Post sees itself as a newspaper written by professionals, professional journalists, who are peers with other professionals, and they saw Hillary Clinton as a kind of, um, uh, a, a sort of, a, a, the, uh, what would you call it, a, a high achievement of this sort of professional order. She was a super lawyer back in her Arkansas days. She had been Secretary of State. She was extremely talented, had this fancy education, very smart woman, accomplished in so many ways. She was the uh, consummate professional. And Bernie Sanders was a kind of, uh, they saw him as a kind of left-wing demagogue, like from the 1930s, like a Huey Long kind of figure. And uh, you know, between the two, the choice was absolutely obvious for them, and they rallied around Hillary Clinton in a kind of extraordinary way. And um, they also said Sanders, uh, you know, you, you could not uh, propose an idea if it did, you couldn't even talk about an idea if it didn't have a good chance of getting through Congress. You know, you have to be in the center. You cannot even mention or suggest things that are outside of this very narrow realm that is defined by the Washington Post op-ed page. They have a certain power in Washington to, to define legitimacy. And they don't like anybody that steps outside of that. And they, uh, this, anyhow, the essay, it's one of my better essays. I'm very proud of it. Because what, what makes it especially interesting is that while the Washington Post is flexing its muscle and denouncing this guy, newspapers in America are dying. I mean, th this is one of the other like things about America that you wouldn't understand in Germany. But America is an enormous country. It has 300 million people in it, and it covers an entire continent. And once upon a time, every town in that continent had a newspaper, thousands of newspapers all over America. 
And in the last 20 years, they're, they're basically, they're either dying or dead. And like when I went to that town that I was describing in Missouri, their paper was dead. My hometown is Kansas City. It had a famous newspaper once, the Kansas City Star. It's down to a shadow of its, it's nothing. It's a terrible thing to behold. Even a big city like Chicago, which was, remember the front page? Have you guys ever seen the front page? Famous for its newspapers. They're down to nothing. They're so weak. They're so small. Uh, but the Washington Post is thriving. While all these other newspapers have died, the Washington Post is doing very well. Jeff Bezos has come in. He's spent millions of dollars, bought them a new office building. They have parties with um, members of the cabinet. You know, it's, uh, they hang around with governors and U.S. senators, and they identify upwards. This is a peculiarity of the professional class. They identify upwards with the powerful, with the mighty, even as... You know, the floor is caving in under them. Their, their own, their real, their actual peers, their fellow members of their profession are like, they're on, they're on unemployment now. They're driving for Uber, you know. They're dog groomers now, you know. And so, the, but what's curious is that as this disaster has unfolded, it has made the, the posts and also the New York Times, their identification with the powerful much more intense. It's like a hopeful kind of thing. By the way, that's a form of irrationality. There's irrationality of all sorts of different kinds. So what are the posts going to, what are they going to do now? Let's say that the, that the Democrats, Bernie Sanders has a good chance this time. What if the Democrats nominate him? What if they nominate Elizabeth Warren, who is very similar, very close to Bernie Sanders? What if they nominate Cory Booker, who used to be a centrist, but is now saying a lot of things like Bernie Sanders? What is the post going to do when they've got Trump on one side? And you know a left winger on the other. I honestly don't know. They will be in a in a very um, a very difficult position. Um, I can't imagine they will endorse Trump. There's almost no newspapers in America endorse Trump. Do you know how many? There were two. Out of the hundred biggest papers in America, there were two that endorsed Trump. Nobody wanted anything to do with them. Um, I, I don't see how that how that changes. They might endorse nobody, <laughs> but that's you know anyhow. I talk too much, folks, and I really, no, no, no. I we're all, so all these, for coming out. All these and, people uh, came to hear you, and uh, we're very glad that you do. And, oh, and I brought a pen. Uh, it's a very special <laughs> pen. It's a bright red Sharpie. So and I will. Oh, did I, I didn't tell the story about uh, about Trump's favorite movie. Go ahead. You want to hear it, or shall we save that for drinks afterwards? I'll just tell you. I'll give you a teaser. You know what his favorite movie is? Citizen Kane. Do you remember, you all, you all ever seen this movie, the Orson Welles movie from the 40s? Yes. So uh, I, at first I suspected it. it's like Trump just, he says he likes it because it's, it's, it's every, every critic says it's the best movie ever made and Trump wants people to think that he, he knows, you know, what the critics think is good. Like that's classy, right? That's a, that's a top quality film <laughs> and I like it. It's my favorite film too. But I watched it recently and there's this scene uh, Kane runs for, he wants to be governor of New York. He's running to be governor of New York. And you know what his big campaign promise is? He's going to put his rival in prison. Ah. <laughs> it's lock her up. It's oh, like, wow. <laughs> yeah. God, I haven't seen the movie in and decades. And also the, the man's narcissism is incredible. They show him giving this speech, you know, in Madison Square Garden or something, and he's behind, behind him is this, like, 100-foot-high portrait of his own face. <laughs> <laughs> so it's totally Trump. Oh, wow. Wow. All right. Well, um, on that note, I'm going to invite you to have a glass of wine downstairs with us. Um, buy a book if you like, and Tom will sign it in red. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to join me in thanking Tom Frank.